challenging, but it's also challenging, of course, is I guess, you know, it's a challenge out there for the industry to actually get to net zero. When we look at the advantages of natural gas, I think we can see right now it's absolute necessity. But where would you say are the big advantages that will actually perhaps build in more sustainability for gas? So I think, um, first of all, I agree very much with everything that's been said already. Uh, I, I, I do think the climate change challenge is fundamentally how do we wean Asia off uh, coal? Because that's where the, the growth is. Uh, we've got 80 percent of the world's uh, current coal consumption in Asia. China alone is, is half the world's and, and India another 15 percent. Uh, so everything that's done in, in Europe or the US isn't really going to matter. Uh, if that trend continues with the two or three power plants a week that, uh, that we heard about. And so gas will play a key role as an enabler of renewables. It's a necessary complement. And the UAE energy policy for 2050 has exactly that balance between around 40% of uh, natural gas and 40% of renewables. Uh, and I, I do think it's unhelpful, the, the whole fossil fuels versus renewables mindset that people have uh, out there in the public. We need to break away from that. Oil is about transportation and making stuff um, and, and very important stuff, you know, including masks and sanitizers and vaccines and, and medicines and all the stuff we've come to rely on. Gas is a power fuel uh, and it needs to be looked at. Uh, uh, and it's actually gas replacing coal that's had a hundred times bigger impact on reducing CO2 emissions in the last 10 years than all the electrical vehicle, electric vehicles in the world. But we don't get the credit uh, uh, as an industry. We do need to measure and improve uh, our operations in terms of methane leakage, in terms of flaring. I mean, we as Crescent Petroleum, we're now 85% uh, natural gas. We've cut our carbon intensity to a third of the industry average are flaring down to 0.7% and trying to push that further. So I think all of that is going to be important for our industry, but in parallel, we do need to advocate for the industry. Uh, Wood Mackenzie's estimated we need $2 trillion of investment in the industry between now and 2040. The concern is uh, that those sources of financing and investment are starting to dry up because somehow we've been put in this bucket as not part of the solution. And until the technologies of storage and hydrogen and carbon capture uh, get cracked, and none of them have been at scale yet, let's admit it, uh, gas will, will be absolutely a necessary complement and, and a destination, not, not just a transition. Majid, I want to bring you in on this, because I know it's an area that you're very passionate to about the growth agenda. And when we look in the West, actually, a lot of people are calling for a complete overhaul of the energy system. And there's a, a sense of impatience around. But can the world actually pursue economic growth while at the same time really achieve the net zero ambitions? Majid, what do you think? So I think, you know, I totally agree with what Sherry said. I think part of the problem, if you look at the UN SDGs, and I, I think they're an excellent list, for most developed countries, the only one that really matters is, is climate change. Uh, the rest are not an issue. But for most of the developing world, health, education, poverty, all, you know, all of them are, uh, are an issue. And energy access is actually a, a number eight, I think, before climate change. We still have a billion people almost with no electricity, three billion people with no clean cooking, uh, relying on wood and coal. Uh, and so absolutely, the developing world is where the growth is. And it cannot be a Western message that, sorry, you are not allowed to have our standards of living. I mean, that kind of hypocrisy won't fly. That will be seen as a neo-colonialism. Uh, and it can't just be, sorry, you're not allowed to expect grid, uh, reliable grid power, uh, you know, have a solar, solar panel and a battery and that'll be you done. It's not going to work. And, and we haven't even, you know, we're still really focused on Asia now. Africa is coming. Uh, so it, it does need to absolutely take into account the needs of, of the developing uh, countries. And I, for one, think that the developed countries will have to pay for it, not just lecture about it. There's no point spending a trillion euros in Europe when the demand growth is in, uh, is in Asia. It's like rearranging the furniture in the bedroom when the living room's on fire. 
Majid, come in here. We had been talking earlier too, and as you said, you know that the Middle East almost found gas by by mistake when he was looking for oil. But perhaps in this region, as you say too, you know, is there more growth for gas, more development for gas? I mean, is this just a good time to be looking at the the gas market here in the Middle East because it's really not reached its maturity yet? Would you say? Yeah, I mean, the, our region has 40% of the world's proven uh, natural gas reserves. Natural but as you said, reserves. most of that was discovered looking for oil. And it's only really in the last few years, the last five to 10 five years, to that gas has gas. become a target for exploration and development here in our region in a major way, driven by the, the rapid growth in power demand and also for, for industry and, and population uh, growth. What we really need, I think, to um, uh, improve that development, accelerated in our region, is the right regulations to encourage investments in different part of the value chain. Because gas is obviously not like oil, not fungible. You can't store it and 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 ship it as easily without LNG infrastructure or pipeline. So we really need the right regulations to encourage investment and in, in private sector investment, not just relying on state budgets in every element of the chain, as well as clear and transparent uh, pricing uh, uh, you know, in the upstream. Uh, and that will also require reform of subsidies downstream, particularly electricity subsidies, which is starting to happen, but, but still has further to go. And I think you know, worldwide, the, the three things that the gas needs to get a push, and in, in many developing countries, uh, it's air quality that's leading to a push for gas in China and India, for example. Uh, but the first is, let's be honest, that 100% renewables today won't work and for the foreseeable future, and therefore there will be an important role for gas and power. And that message really needs to be uh, clear for the development banks and, and some of the private banks who are turning their back on quote unquote, unquote fossil fuels and when they do that and, and refuse to invest in gas in developing countries, you will have more burning of coal and you will have more CO2 emissions and it'll be self-defeating. The second one that would help, uh, Sharif mentioned and others, a carbon price would help bridge that uh, gap because in many of these developing countries without that, coal will continue to be more competitive. And the third, I think, is trade wars are not helpful. If these countries don't have uh, large enough domestic resources of natural gas, as in the case in China, for example, or in India, and trade wars cause concern over security of supply, that will put a dent in, in the growth. Uh, so I think those three things would go a big way, particularly in developing countries, uh, in ensuring the coal to gas switch that, that complements renewable growth. Now I've only got about a minute left for each one of you, and um, you know some fascinating discussion here. Um, Majid, if in sort of wrapping up, you can combine a few things perhaps together with us in a question here from Stephen Green, and just following on from what Sheikh Nawaf was just saying there. I mean, it is it's expensive, and this is investment, and technology is absolutely essential. And we also look at the banks really paying attention to ESG, all of this in place here. But you know, once these new generation assets are put in place, how can this is coming from Stephen Green. We prepare to decarbonize them in the future. And what commitments you know, are the industry making to make sure that they can do it? Are you happy there's enough commitments there? So I think you know, the, the risk we have is year after year, there's a new buzzword or new, you know, uh, that everybody's talking about every year. And they're all great, but they all require a lot of investment uh, and a lot of time to be able to scale. And, uh, and, and there are limits to where the cost will go down. There's unfortunately out there, thinking that energy is the same as mobile telephony or, or computing and you've got some Moore's law and the cost reductions will be uh, infinite and endless. That's not the case. We're, we're, we're getting close to limits when it comes to solar uh, and wind. So the takeaway I have, it's absolutely important to make those investments for the long term, but we need to take steps right now to prevent the growth of emissions that's still happening this year despite the pandemic in Asia because of coal and natural gas is the obvious way to do that but the world has to take certain steps to make sure that happens because at the moment there's there's underinvestment and it won't happen 